well, we hope we've got a surplus. Once you've conducted, <laughs> once you've conducted the, the the budget, um, the budget arrangement, you're probably going to find yourself in in uh, in one of these two camps, or maybe a, a foot in both. So you've either got yourself to a point where you've got a surplus and and you've got some, uh, you've got a springboard or a foundation for further investment and wealth creation, or you might find yourself at the bottom of a sinkhole um, where you are actually, you know, where you've got more money going out than coming in. Um, of course, there, there's a break-even point there somewhere as well. It's then, I guess, at that point that, that you then, again, go back to the goals and objectives and you say, what is it that I'm looking to achieve over a period of time and how do I need to make some adjustments to make sure that I can get there? I guess the other point that I would like to make is that, I guess, you know, as I said before, budgeting is, is a, bit of a, a bit of a dirty word, but, um, you know, and I think, when I think of budgeting, I, the, 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 the Tammy May from my budget sort of conjures, conjures up sort of, uh, sort of thoughts of the struggling family, but I mean, budgeting is just as important to, to an extremely affluent person as it is to someone um, who's scrapping to make ends meet, uh, because it's likely that their goals and objectives are going to be much, much greater than the person uh, sitting next to them. And I guess if I could just use, um, use an example here, uh, who's heard of, uh, of one of the most successful investors in the world, Warren Buffett? Yeah, some people have heard of him. Okay, Warren Buffett. Uh, you know, depending on how markets are travelling, goes from being perhaps the, first, the the richest man in the world to the third richest man in the world, and he started with nothing. He's 84 years of age now, but he still lives in the same home in Omaha in the United States that he did in the 1950s, and he still drives the same model Lincoln Town Car that he did back in the 1950s. Now, of course, he doesn't need to. He could buy 15 Bentleys and a $50 million house. But for him, that is a form of budgeting because he chooses to spend his money or save his money and use it for other areas of his life. So. All right, thank you. One of, the, one of the more common questions we get asked uh, as advice, particularly by young people, is should I repay my home loan or should I invest? Uh, now, example here, we've got $10,000. Uh, typical situation, you've got your home there or should I use the money and maybe go into the share market? Now, it's important that you're comparing apples with apples here. Just in this example, you can see, say you've got that $10,000. <coughs> You use that to pay down your home loan. So in effect, you're saving yourself $700 in interest, 7% interest rate. So by paying $10,000 in your home loan, you're basically saving yourself $700 a year ongoing for the term of the loan. The opposite and perhaps a uh, seemingly more sexy option is to put the $10,000 into the share market or another growth asset like property. Uh, and as you can see here, your $10,000 in shares you would expect over the longer term to give you around $1,200, being a 12% average rate of return, uh, which is typically what you can expect to get on the share market over a longer period of time. So most people look at this situation and they're like, well, okay, it's pretty clear. I'll, I'll put my money in the share market because uh, I'm going to be $500 better off. What you need to take into account though is tax, uh, because with, with your home uh, being your principal residence where you're living, the, the government gives you tax concessions. So there, there's really no tax associated with uh, costs or any profits made on your home. With uh, growth investments like shares and property, you do pay tax. So yes, you might earn that $1,200 uh, in interest or sorry, income or dividends, but you've got to pay tax on that amount. So 40% tax rate, you're going to be paying tax of around $480. And, and as you can see, the net result there is about $720. So, now it's a much more even situation. And, and in this situation, we would always be suggesting pay down the home loan because it's a guaranteed rate of return. You're, you're really locking in that 7% interest rate for the life of the loan. Whereas with the share market, yes, you might get your 12%, $1,200. You might get 20% in one year. But in the next year, you could get negative 10%. So given that uncertainty, the, the risk-free option is to always reduce your home loan. So, uh, if you're in that situation, you might want to keep that in mind. Another one I just wanted to touch on, uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard before, 
is consolidating your debt. Uh, and essentially what that means is many people have the credit cards, um, maybe a couple of thousand owing on the credit card, you're being charged interest of 20%, which if you're only pay making the minimum of payments on that, can take a decade to pay that credit card debt off. You might have a car loan, again, you're paying interest at 9%, whereas with your home loan, you're paying interest at 7 So. If you're in a situation where you're even a little bit ahead on your home loan, you've got some equity or uh, access to a regional facility, uh, it could be worthwhile taking that money out and in essentially repaying the credit card debt, repaying the car loan. So bringing that debt under the umbrella of the home loan where you're only paying interest of 7% rather than 20%. Um, so just a, a little tip there. So I suppose now, um, Stepping into into the second phase of of um, of the evening, uh, in terms of looking towards investment, um, although as Simon rightly pointed out, paying off the home loan is, is actually a form of investing. But um, when we're looking at, at where we're going to invest our money, we need to have a look again. I know it's uh, it sound like a broken record, but coming back to those goals and objectives, and the reason we do that is because what we what we really need to look at is when are you going to need access to your money? And that is a, the, the very first thing you need to think about when it comes to determining how you're going to invest it. Um, reason being is, generally speaking, if you need access to money, whether it be for a, a new car or a holiday, for example, and it's within a three year period, we would, can, we would, we would urge you to consider staying away from assets that can be volatile in nature and, and really, you know, we're talking about property or, or shares, as an example. Um, to show you why, I just got this graphic, which is essentially the, the we're cutting off a little bit of the last few years, which obviously the line goes back up. But um, this is effectively the last 20 years of, of Australian share market returns. And if you can, I've plotted two areas on this graph here, which are essentially five year periods. And what they show is in 94, I chose that because it was a high point in the market. And what it shows is that if you invested your money uh, in 1994 and you required access to capital in, after five years in 1999, in 94 you can see the, the, the market was probably around about 2,400 points. Now it tails off to below 2,000 during that period, a few ups and downs. But if you needed access to that money in five, in five years in 1999, you'd see that it's at around about 3,000, the market's at around about 3,000 points. So what's happened is in the short term, the money, you, you, the value of your, of your capital or your investment has gone down. But over a five year period, which is what we would term to be nearing that longer term period, um, the value of your investment has at least broken even and now started to forge ahead. If you needed access to capital in, you know, let's say 1996, you would have actually lost some money and therefore your purchasing power is, is, is reduced. The same goes again from 04 to 09. If we are, so I, in, in closing that point off, five years, three to five years plus, certainly growth assets are worth a consideration, a strong consideration. In the shorter term, we would encourage you to consider a high interest earning bank account or even a term deposit. Now, in terms of looking at different uh, different forms of investing, I've mentioned the two most popular ones, property and shares. So, so we're going to stick with those. Um, I have to say, you know, we we very much encourage a diversified approach of, of both property and shares. I'll probably focus a little bit more on shares just purely because I want to unlock some of the unknowns that uh, about shares, and a lot of people already know a lot about property or seemingly know a lot about property. First, some myths, if you if you don't mind. The first myth we come across quite often is uh, is the perceived value of an investment. So if I was to just use an example of, let's just say this was a share certificate for a half a million dollar investment into BHP, and in the other hand, I don't have any right now, but I'll, in the other hand I had a set of keys to a, to a, a St Kilda apartment that was also worth half a million dollars. If I ask someone, or we ask a lot of people, which do they really value more? Nine times out of ten, they're going to say the property because it's a tangible asset. You can drive past it, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can see the people that, that are living in it and paying you rent, whereas this over here is just a piece of paper. When, of course, this isn't just a, a piece of paper, 
if you own a half a million dollar investment in BHP, you you own half a million. you you own, I guess, half a million dollars is still a, a small value in BHP, but you own a small part of BHP, the business. And as a shareholder, um, you know, the directors of that business have have a responsibility to to represent your best wishes as a shareholder. And I'll touch on that a little bit more uh, in a sec. Um, the other one is that. Property app, property app form shares, always has, always will. Um, we're here to tell you that, that in actual fact over a, a 20 year plus period, the returns on both asset classes are virtually the same. And if you do a Google search and you write property versus shares, you'll probably get about you know, 20 search results and each one of them will say one or the other. Um, the returns on property versus or property and shares are you know, anywhere from 10 to 12% over the last 20 odd years. Um, generally speaking, if, someone, if, if someone's saying that property has outperformed shares, they're probably not taking into account a lot of the running costs that come out of a property along the way. So again, it comes back to that diversification. You're going to have different periods where property's going to do really well, as it did, you know, even throughout periods of the GFC, property still in certain areas still did very well, whereas shares obviously didn't, and, and vice versa. Um, the, other, the other, I guess, myth is that there's a perception out there that shares are more risky than property. Um, we would argue that that is a myth, whereas we would also argue that um, you'd be right in, in your perception or feeling that shares are more volatile than property. And that's purely because, as you all know, shares can be valued in Australia and overseas on nearly you know, every second of every day. If the market falls two or three percent, you'll have you know news headlines at six o'clock saying thirty-five billion wiped off the share market. The difference is, and it's because it's a more liquid market. Information is much more readily available uh, when it comes to economy and share market performance than it is in relation to property. Whereas, you know, our, as Simon and I were talking about the other day, you don't drive past every street in your neighbourhood and have a neon sign on every property saying what the value is today. Yet, if we had if we had access to information around um, the amount of new loan approvals at Westpac on a Tuesday, versus you might see the market, you know, the property market go up a few percent, whereas on a Thursday you might see an influx of people walking in, handing in the keys, saying oh, I can't pay my loans anymore. Therefore, the property market might go down. We we don't have access to that information. Now. Just wanting to, I guess, you know, break down the barrier in terms of your, your level of understanding when it comes to shares. Um, and, 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 you know, the reason I'm going through this is, is, is the feedback from last year's Young Wealth Seminar, but it's also what we see every day with new clients walking through the door. That, um, you know, even though some people say they really understand what a share is, when you flesh it out, there's, there's, a, few more, there's a few more things that, that, are need, that need to be known. Um, Again, talking about that share ownership, as I said before, when it comes to um, the ownership structure, you own a very small piece or a very large piece if you're very rich uh, in in a in a company in an Australian in an Australian company. You have the ability to turn up um, to an AGM once a year. The directors sit up in front of you. You can vote um, and and be a part of the decision making process of that company, and then it's therefore the responsibility of the directors to carry out your wishes. Obviously, a property it's a it's a it's a it's a physical ownership of um, a physical ownership of a of an apartment, so a piece of property or or a piece of land. It's rather self-explanatory. Um, in terms of in terms of the trading platform for for both, I guess starting with property, we all know that you make negotiations for a real estate agent um, or a property advocate, as we have one here. <laughs> uh, or you stick your finger up on a Saturday afternoon and, and you bid for a property and you get it that way. Um, in terms of the, the listed share market, um, there are trading platforms as we as we probably know in terms of the Australian Stock Exchange is one. Now the ASX is actually a, a listed company in its own right that provides the service and a mechanism for people to go and and and, and purchase and, and sell their, their shares. 